Welcome to our second ever Code Monk video. Remember, if you want to solve these for yourselves, head on to Code Monk. The coding link is in the description below. This is the second easy level problem under arrays and strings. This is called Monk and Inversions. Monk's best friend, Micro, who happens to be an awesome programmer, got him to make an integer matrix of size n by n. Monk is taking coding classes from Micro. They have just completed array inversions and Monk was successful in writing a program to count the number of inversions. What is an inversion? So an inversion follows these two rules. Firstly, we've got to take two numbers. Their ordinates are i, j, p, q. i should be less than or equal to p, j should be less than or equal to q, and m of i, j should be greater than m of p, q. Now, the first step is to visualize these things. What is i less than equal to p, j less than equal to q? What do these two mean? Then we look at the third condition. If we have a look at our input and output, we can see two is the number of test cases. n is uh, the dimension of the matrix. It's going to be of size n by n, in this case, three by three. And we're going to be given a matrix. Let's have a look at a different matrix and try to visualize. First, we'll try to visualize what this means. i less than or equal to p and j less than or equal to q means. We can see our matrix here. This is a three by three matrix. Let's traverse it normally. That is row wise traversal. We start with element zero, zero. Now we need to compare this with all the elements that have a value of i and j that are greater than or equal to this value. This value is zero, zero. So we know zero, one. i and j are both greater than or equal to four, uh, zero, zero. In the case zero, two, i and j are both greater than or equal to zero, zero. One, zero is also valued. So is one, one, so is one, two, up until two, two. So what does that mean? That means we're going to be looking at this entire box right here with the top left corner as zero, zero. Now, if you look at the next element, that is zero, one. What elements are valid? What elements do we compare with this element? Zero, zero is invalid. That's because its J index is less than the current j index. The current j index is one. This element's j index is zero. So this is an invalid element. So is eight. That's because its j index is zero. And nine's j index zero is invalid as well. So this entire column, we've got to disregard. Meaning we look at the rectangle with the top left element as zero, one. Similarly, if we look at nine, these are the only three elements we can consider because these other two columns, they've got elements with a J value that's less than the current J value. Let's have a look at one last element. Let's have a look at say eight. Now the valid elements are as follows. And that's because the first row has a value that's less than the current row. In other words, we've got to draw a rectangle with the element in question as the top left element. And we've got to compare all other elements with this element. Now let's see what the second condition is. The second condition tells us m of ij should be greater than m of pq. We've got to count the number of elements in the rectangles that are greater than the current element, the top left element. So if we have a look at four, we know every element is valid. So we can check seven. Seven is not less than four. Nine is not less than four. Eight is not less than four, but two is. Two is less than four, which is why we'll have a global counter, which increases by one when we encounter two. Similarly, when we encounter zero, it will increase by one. And when we encounter one, it will increase by one. Now we're done with four. We don't have to bother with it anymore. Let's have a look at seven. Seven means we're going to be considering these elements, two, zero, one, and four. All of these four elements are less than seven, which is why our count now increases by four. We proceed onwards by doing the exact same thing. We look at nine. Nine means we only consider this column. Both the elements are less than nine. When we see eight, there are four elements less than eight. So our counter increases by four. When we have a look at two, there are two elements, zero and one. Zero doesn't have any element that's less than it. Nine has two elements that are less than it. One has zero elements that are less than it. And four has zero elements that are less than it. That's because we are only comparing it with itself. That's why our final answer will be the counter you see. Here we can see the code. As usual, 
we're going to take our in input. T is the number of test cases. So raw input reads the first line. Now the next raw input will read the next line. That is three gets converted into int stored in N. We convert one, two, three into an array and store it in ARR of zero. Four, five, six gets stored in ARR of one. Seven, eight, nine gets stored in ARR of two, effectively making it a three by three matrix. Now we're going to initialize a counter. Count is initially going to be zero. We're going to have an ing to look at every single element. Now remember, within each every element, there's going to be a box. When we look at four, we're going to have to draw one box starting at location zero, zero. When we look at seven, we're going to have to draw a box starting at location zero, one. So the way we draw a box is by having two loops. That's why within the IJ loop, we're going to have two more loops. We could name them KL, but since we're feeling dangerous, we'll name them VK, V for Vivek and K for, well, the last letter in Vivek. Now, if ARR of IJ is greater than ARR of VK, what does this mean? If the top left element is greater than any other valid element, we will increase the count. Finally, we print the count for every test case. Let's see if this works. We can see that our entire result has been accepted for all 10 inputs. So guys, this question is meant to solidify your understanding uh, to help you get a better grip on matrices and two dimensional arrays and how to traverse them. That's the main part about this. By looking at this condition, right? We've got to figure out how the traversal happens. After that, we can look at the remaining conditions. So guys, the next couple of problems, the next two problems are going to be the medium level problems present in this section. That is to say, cyclic shift and minimum and XOR all. The last video, the fifth video will be about unlucky 30. If you like these videos, make sure to hit the three buttons on your screen and leave your comments down below if they're helping you at all. It's been Vivek guys, and I'll see you all next time.